Roddy, all yours. Not at all. Uh, it's a, thank you very much indeed. Um, so there's a great phrase from John Lennon where he said, uh, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. And I think 2020 is a perfect illustration of that. And 2020 is also a huge illustration of the importance of behavioral science, because suddenly almost every business question has become a behavioral question. You know, if you imagine you were a large airline at the beginning of the year in January, your assumption of demand would be made by extrapolating past trends. <clears throat> and that business of extrapolating past trends, generally upwards and optimistically, is, I think, very, very dangerous in itself, because what we've seen this year is that human behavior can change very, very rapidly. And I think in the case of business air travel, find a completely new equilibrium. I don't think people's business travel patterns, or to some extent, their leisure travel patterns, will actually revert to the state before. Um, but one of those dangerous things of that extrapolation is it tends to take behavior for granted. And so if you were holding a board meeting um, uh, in that airline in January this year, most of your discussion would be something around how you hedge airline fuel prices, for example. It would have been discussions about financing. It would have been discussions about capital. And suddenly, probably 80% of the discussion in that board meeting now is how do we get people back onto aircraft? And so what this pandemic has done, undoubtedly, is it's brought behavior to the fore because whenever the world changes significantly the importance of behavioral understanding goes up immensely because you can no longer take it for granted you can no longer make, make assumptions about future behavior on the basis of past behavior you know i genuinely don't know what the prognosis is for something like uh, road traffic for example or business air travel but what I do know is it's no longer safe to base your projections for 2021 on what people were doing in 2019. So in one sense, I think um, behavioral science uh, enjoys a very, very good future. One of the things we noticed with Nudgestock is the audience, when we ran Nudgestock online, the audience, which peaked out at 120,000, was 10 times larger than we ever envisaged. And one of the reasons we understood for, from that was actually the huge level of growing interest in behavioral science in non-weird countries. Now, for those of you not familiar with weird, I know it's part of the title of uh, the whole event, but it generally the research and the conversation about behavioral economics or behavioral science takes place in countries which are, and it's an acronym, uh, Western, uh, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. And um, uh, one of the things we're very conscious of is the fact that you know, so much of the research has been done on, for example, college students at Ivy League universities. And it's only fair to acknowledge that these people are not remotely representative of the world's population as a whole um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, their necessary biases or tendencies. And there's some fascinating finding, for example, that some visual illusions, for example, that famous illusion about the two lines when you actually, uh, when you extend the lines either in an ending in an arrow or ending in a reverse arrow, uh, that illusion seems not to work very well among people who've grown up in round buildings. It seems to be an illusion that's been heightened by living in buildings that are square because it's something the brain learns to do when we look at three-dimensional objects. If you think about it, a line with two arrows at the end is essentially what you might call the corner of a particular shape. And we've been conscious for some time of the need uh, for uh, uh, behavioral science to become much, much less weird. And that's happening. And in particular, I think it's being led by India, which here's my first prediction, will be an extraordinary behavioral science powerhouse. Uh, well, it will rise to prominence there uh, as, as, as rapidly as the next three or four years because the volume of interest combined with a hugely educated and curious population, combined actually with the Zoom revolution, which gives people vastly more power to access information and opinion from all over the world and from each other, uh, I think will lead to um, you know, an extraordinary kind of um, uh, 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 
extent to which I think India will become the center of this revolution uh, in another few years. So what, what do I predict? Well, as I said, life is what happens to you, what John Lennon said, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. At the moment, of course, we're a small community of people. It's an incredibly small community of people who, and I have to be incredibly grateful for this, are in immensely helpful, collaborative, cooperative. It's very, very collegiate. Now, will one of my fears is that if behavioral science becomes successful and big, some of that will be lost. You know, we'll develop some of those kind of worse, not just, not just by the way, the competitive aspects of business, but also the competitive dogmatic aspects of academia, which, you know, it's worth remembering that dogma um, is something that affects everything from academic uh, research to politics. And it's dogma, I think, is the real enemy of behavioral science. I mean, an interesting quality of, of good behavioral science is it doesn't really sit anywhere on the political spectrum. You know, it isn't seen in the, U in the United States, for example, it tended to be the Obama administration who paid the most attention to behavioral economics and behavioral science, and they created a behavioral science unit. Um, in, in the UK, it was the Cameron government. It isn't something which is easily um, pigeonholed as being something of the left or something of the right. And so, you know, the one threat I can see to behavioral science as it becomes more successful is that the business aspect of it becomes more kind of uh, competitive and less collegiate, simply as a product of scale. And that we've already seen, you know, there are already factions in this in this thing. But broadly speaking, if you're an interested outsider in behavioral science, the factions don't ex don't affect you very much. I've never fully understood. We all know what we're talking about here, which is the kind of heuristics versus biases uh, divide in behavioral science. To be honest, the <laughs> To anybody outside academia, the disagreements don't really seem to be the basis of an extreme disagreement at all. Um, but I, I do worry about that, that we become the victim of our own success, that as we become bigger, we become factionalized. Even in the commercial area of behavioral science, other behavioral science agencies, which are notionally competing for the same business, we all help each other out. We all share information very generously. And we do that because we're small and we realize that it's much, much more important to grow the category at the moment than to grow our share of the category. And, you know, the moment that collegiate, if you're an interested outsider in behavioral science, the factions don't, ex don't affect you very much. I've never fully understood. We all know what we're talking about here, which is the kind of heuristics versus biases uh, divide in behavioral science. To be honest, the <laughs> to anybody outside academia, the disagreements don't really seem to be the basis of an extreme disagreement at all. Um, but I, I do worry about that, that we become the victim of our own success, that as we become bigger, we become factionalized. Even in the commercial area of behavioral science, other behavioral science agencies, which are notionally competing for the same business, we all help each other out. We all share information very generously. And we do that because we're small and we realize that it's much, much more important to grow the category at the moment than to grow our share of the category. And, you know, the moment that collegiate spirit dies, I'm almost tempted to move on and find something else. But getting back, I think dogma is the real en enemy of behavioral science. That, And, and by the way, um, when people say talk about political dogma, they always go, ah, oh, yes, it's nationalism, it's Trump, or it's Modi, or it's Brexit, okay? And they always regard that as dogmatic. It's worth remembering that the sort of liberal economic order that preceded those phenomena was in its own way no less dogmatic about certain things. It didn't really seek to understand a wide range of opinions on certain matters. It made certain assumptions about globalization, certain assumptions about scale and efficiency, and it effectively imposed those on people on the basis of economic assumptions without asking what the psychological effects of extreme globalization might be. And so it's worth remembering that actually dogmatic politics, both on the left, the right, and the center, spends very, very little time trying to consider psychology um, as part of its um, 
Uh, it spends very little time looking at psychology as part of its repertoire. It, it usually derives some assumption from an economic model which is not really even empirically justified in many cases, and seeks to impose those on people uh, on the assumption that what economics says is good for people is what people want. And so all forms of political dogma, I think, are a problem uh, if you understand people and look at the world through a psychological lens. And the other thing, the other thing I think we have to be content with, and this is a strange one, is we have to be content going forward in behavioral science with a high degree of ambiguity. And I'm going to talk here uh, just for a second. Uh, somebody said something incredibly useful to me. Uh, Matt Ridley, who you may know as a writer on evolutionary biology in the UK. He made a very valuable point, which I think is something we should all bear in mind, which is that he said biology as one famous biologist said, is the science of exceptions. And he made that point to explain that there isn't going to be a kind of Isaac Newton in biology, okay? There isn't going to be, you know, the absolute kind of uh, straightforward mathematical solution to everything in biology. And what Darwin did, for example, is he wandered around the world looking at what was unusual because it was what was unusual which carried the most informational freight okay he didn't seek to make generalizable rules instead what he did was he studied the exceptions and i think that's an important thing for behavioral science to understand we got terribly upset in some cases about the failure to replicate and my view is always i never expected this stuff to replicate okay i know that for, for a start people's behavior is hugely dependent on context both a social context and an environmental context and so <clears throat> to be absolutely honest we should be alarmed if we find that studies reliably replicate across a range of contexts because the central finding of behavioral science is that human behavior is hugely contextually determined and my view was that if you understand that what we're engaged in is a science of exceptions not a science of universal laws that should concern us less we should be in the healthily curious business of going, you would expect people to do this, but they're not. Let's find out why. That's essentially what Darwin did. Why do all these beaks in the, you know, why do all these finches have completely different shaped beaks, even though they're living on islands, which are only sort of several miles away? That would seem strange. Ultimately, it, it turns out that it's the different fauna on the island and the beaks are optimized for that. Now, we've just discovered some findings which are very interesting from some research which is that your level of food waste is less if you do a big shop than if you do frequent small shops now if you think about it for a second that's not what you'd expect is it you kind of expect people who shopped fairly frequently and did occasion-based shops to waste surprisingly little food and you'd expect people who did a big big shop where you effectively you know uh, you bought a whole week shopping for a whole family um, why is that? Now, I think we'll be able to find an explanation. It may simply be that if you do a big shop, you tend to have a bigger family. And if you have a bigger family, there's, there are more opportunities to use up food. It's also found that people who shop online for groceries waste less food than people who go to a shop. Why is that? And my view, my view about this is that this science is really its detective work. You know, the mentality we should seek to adopt is not the mentality of a kind of rule based dogma like economics. Uh, and th this, this echoes something that John Maynard Keynes said about economics. I think Keynes once said that he hoped that economics would become a bit like dentistry, which is it was a small and helpful um, form of um, activity where you could kind of fix a one hour appointment with your local economist and he'd help you out with a business question or something. And in some ways, I don't want behavioral science to become, uh, you know, a great sort of cathedral of dogma, uh, which some sciences always aspire to do, largely, I think, because of physics envy. I, I, I want it to be a home for the perpetually curious, which is the very, very simple thing I would say is the value of behavioral science, both in business and in government, isn't what it tells you. It's what it makes you doubtful about.
and that's that's my real that's my point about this is actually a science of exceptions this is like biology this is an area where we go and say we would assume x but maybe it's the opposite it's also a science of contradictions um i think you know the unacknowledged father of modern behavioral science is probably robert cialdini with his books like influence and nearly everybody who read those books will have noticed that the common rules of salesmanship or of persuasion actually contain inherent contradictions. For example, there are two ways of selling a product. You either sell it on the basis of scarcity, which is not many people have this, so it must be good, or you sell it on the basis of social proof, which is everybody has one of these, so it must be good. So one of the vital things to understand is, as I said in my book, the opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. If you can't sell something on the basis of social proof, sell it on the basis of the fact that nobody has heard of this. It's a trade secret. And if you look at uh, if you look at all of those six Cialdini um, principles, actually, of influence, um, each one of them is almost the opposite conceptually of, of another. And so. Um, so I think one of the important things, I think the most important thing we understand is we don't get hung up on the basis of trying to make this into a Newtonian predictive science. The real value comes here in, um, effectively the real value comes here in understanding this is a science of exceptions and the real value it brings is expanding the possible creative solution space for any problem. That if you bring economics to bear on any problem, it will give you two possible solutions. You either reduce the price or you make the thing itself objectively better. The problem with economics is it generates a very small solution space, which is generally around those tiny number of variables which economics is disproportionately preoccupied with. The magic of psychology is that um, the number of possible solutions you can bring to bear to a problem goes up i would argue it's an exponential increase in the size of the solution space now that partly explains why it's valuable it also explains why it's unpopular in dogmatic areas of politics and dogmatic areas of business because dogmatic people don't want a wider solution space what they love about economics is that it basically is painting by numbers it tells them exactly what to do in every situation even if that thing is wrong because in business and in politics, people have a strong natural aversion to ambiguity. What we have to be is an ambiguity loving discipline, which says essentially the very messiness of this solution space is precisely what makes it valuable. Because um, in, uh, in acknowledging the importance of ambiguity, we suddenly reveal 15 or 20 other possible solutions to a problem which were invisible beforehand someone requoted me on twitter and i'd forgotten i'd even said this but when you attach metrics to a problem as soon as you you define a problem in terms of specific metrics for example you say the important thing about a taxi is that it turns up quickly okay you know, now, I think what Uber discovered is the important thing about a taxi is that you know when it's going to arrive. That's a psychological solution. Uh, it's not a, um, it, it's not a, 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 what you might call an engineering solution. So one of the things I want to do is I'm almost having a campaign which is keep behavioral science ambiguous. The enemy we face is not non-replication or the fact that in different countries, different people respond to the same stimulus in different ways. We should have expected that anyway. You know, I remember reading a piece of research which didn't work and it was performed in Las Vegas and it involved an act of generosity. And I said, you can't test generosity and reciprocation in Las Vegas because Las Vegas is the con man center of the entire world. And if I were in Las Vegas, OK, and someone said here, why don't you have these chips as a present? My first thought is not what a lovely guy. It's I'm part of a scam. I just don't know what's happening yet. OK, now, if someone in the West Country of England says I've, I've baked too many scones and I thought you could have three or four to take home for your children. Right. I probably assume that's an act of generosity. The same thing in Las Vegas. I don't perceive the same way. So two things we need to we need to make it less weird. We need to make it less neurotic about ambiguity because ambiguity to a scientist is a problem because the currency of science is reputation. 
okay and you're terrified of being shown to be wrong ambiguity to a business person is actually a feature not a bug because if only 10 or 15 people are behaving in a weird and unexpected way there's a potential business there so the way the business world of behavioral science and arguably the political world of behavioral science needs to react needs to be much less afraid of ambiguity it needs to see this as a positive it needs to become much less weird and the final thing i think and i'm going to end on this um, is we also need to make it less individualistic i think most of the research is about individual behavior and i think that's partly because it's easy to research and one of the things we need to understand is we need to understand um collective behavior and we need to research it we need to research network effects and what you might call complex complexity theory need to become the bedfellows of behavioral science so network science and, and complexity science um, are in a sense what you might call the second and third you know they're the air force and navy to the behavioral science army I, probably militaristic uh, um, analogies are probably not the best but just to explain there, let's take a look at something that's fascinated me. I know I often bore people talking about Japanese toilets, moist lavatory paper, consumer products, Philips air fryers, consumer products that are brilliant, but which nobody buys. And I've always been interested in that because, you know, I, I'm going to make an outrageous suggestion here. OK, I've got 10 minutes to go. So I think this is the moment to make an outrageous suggestion. I think most of the growth progress and and by the by the way i mean economic growth technological progress ecological progress i think in most of the developed world and even a very large part of the developing world progress and growth is now a psychological and marketing problem it's not a technological problem so if you look at what is the constraint patently okay economics had its origins in the 18th century when there wasn't enough stuff okay you know, even in 18th century england which was pretty rich there wasn't enough stuff for everybody now i would argue that i don't think particularly if you consider the world of software but even in the world of manufacturing a very large portion of the world and by no means all of it but a very large portion of the world essentially has enough supply the problem is demand and unsurprisingly the business and economic world would be very very reluctant to acknowledge that economics is now principally a question of understanding how human behavior changes and how human demands and wants change rather than being a question of efficient supply because it would require them to fundamentally reinvent what they do reinvent what they study and throw away most of the things they spent 15 or 20 years perfecting but i'm not alone in this there are other economists who argue that progress now uh, and that that does mean everything from you know actually the question is not now how 10 years ago 20 years ago the question was how do we make better solar panels the question now is how do you get people to put solar panels on their roof okay bill gates had a wonderful phrase here people don't know how to want the things we can offer them um peter Thiel makes a similar point he says if you've got the best product in the world a magnificent product that wins on all objective dimensions but you don't have an idea about how to sell it to people what you've got is a lousy business and i would argue that the in the developed world in particular and in large parts of the developing world the focus of politics and the focus of business should shift away from obsessing about the efficient supply and distribution of goods and towards a focus on how we can get people to want better and want better for themselves, but want better for society as well. In other words, how can we manufacture not better goods, but better wants? And so that's my first scandalous point. But I actually think that economics in large part now and, and business growth and economic growth is probably a marketing and psychological problem more than it is a logistical and mechanical and engineering problem. Um, now, when I say that, um, I don't think behavioral science, however, on its own contains the answers to how you get people to want and have better. OK, and this is why I say that the understanding of network science and complexity science sits hand in hand. And an example of this, I think, is perfect because the adoption of video conferencing 
during the pandemic is really, really interesting because nothing happened with the price of Zoom or the price of those things. Almost nothing happened in terms of technological improvement in March 2020. You know, nothing suddenly, it wasn't as if a Zoom issue, you know, uh, launched Zoom 2.0 with higher quality or that, you know, nothing much significant changed in the actual objective reality. What changed was that everybody now had an excuse to do something which I suspect many of those people were wanting to do already. So I suspect, I mean, putting it bluntly, I suspect there was a network problem and a scale problem to the adoption of video conferencing and remote working and it, it took the form that everybody believed they could do it themselves but they didn't believe that everybody else could do it now what you quite often have and this is something we need to understand better uh, uh, this is why we need to understand i've got a friend um uh, douglas mcwilliams who's a, who was the former chief economist of ibm and he makes a very valuable point, which we behavioral science folks need to take on board, which is many technologies are useless until they reach a certain level of adoption. So owning the world's only fax machine is by definition useless. I had a friend who owned a fax machine in the 1970s. And I said, what the hell did you do with it then? And he said, well, we had one in Los Angeles and one in London and we faxed each other. But he said, I never faxed anybody else because I didn't know anybody else with a fax in 1970. OK, now, if you can imagine the mobile phone had grown up and because of a technological or legislative peculiarity, the mobile phone only made you only allowed you to call other mobile phones. Right. Now, I had a mobile phone back in the late 80s. It was a company issued thing like a brick. And having a mobile phone then was so rare that when I made a mobile phone call on Oxford Street using the phone, people shouted abuse at me from passing cars. OK. So literally, I was just walking down the road of the pavement, making a call because someone rang me. It wasn't my fault. OK. And people shouted wanker at you as they drove past. OK. Now, <laughs> interestingly, in the very early days of mobile phones, it was very rare you called another mobile phone. You called landlines and mobile phones were interoperable with landlines. And what that meant was that the mobile phone grew very fast because people bought them so that people could call them from home and they could call landlines and very occasionally in the early days of the mobile phone you called another mobile phone and back in 1989 you go oh it's weird we're both on mobiles aren't we it was actually quite an unusual thing to have two people both on a mobile call and it suddenly occurred to me that of course um there was a problem a network problem with remote working which uh, which will still persist which is that physical meetings and remote meetings aren't interoperable very well. You can have everybody working very well when everybody's at home and, it, and a meeting works very well when everybody's sitting around a table. But with the exception of a thing called the meeting owl, which is a wonderful piece of technology produced by owl labs, no one's really cracked the half and half. Now, if you think about that and you look at it in terms of network theory, it's very difficult to get from equilibrium A to e equilibrium B when the intermediate stage is actually very difficult. And so this is why I'm saying if we really need to understand how we can get the most out of human behavior, how we can get people to make choices, to see the world, make decisions in a way which isn't constrained by purely by habit, by social proof. In other words, we break out of the normal constraints and allow people to discover new and better individual and collective behaviours. Um, behavioural science on its own isn't going to be enough. Weird behavioural science on its own certainly isn't going to be enough. Dogmatic behavioural weird science on its own is going to be worse and worse. This is not an area for dogma. It's an area for detective work and exploration. And it's an area for, as I said, it's a science of the exceptions. If we find that something contradicts a previous finding, that's not that's not a bug. That's a feature. But then in addition to this, I think behavioral science will have to break out. This is my you know, my I'm not trying to call it a prediction, but it's a wish list. Um, too much of it is individually focused and too little seeks to understand the dynamics of large scale behavior.
Um, I'll leave you with a wonderful piece of behavioral science, which, is, which comes from the business world, in fact, the Abilene paradox, where a whole group of people can end up doing something that none of them wants to do, okay? Simply because they think it's what everybody else wants to do. And I think, you know, that uh, one of the things I suggested recently is that, you know, a lot of business travel was probably the Abilene paradox. The guy you were meeting was totally happy to do a Zoom call. You would have much preferred to do a Zoom call because it didn't mean you, you meant you didn't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to fly to Frankfurt. I'd much rather do Zoom based or online conferences because the audience is more random. OK. If I talk at a physical conference, it costs several hundred pounds to go. The only people who go are people whose employers are paying. It's a very, very narrow target audience with very few chances of me getting lucky. If I speak at a webinar, um, it's a vastly more diverse target audience, geographically, socially, nationally, in every respect. So what you've done here, by the way, is I'm going to end on this. Um, next year, the year after, I think it'll have to be a festival of behavioral economics, you know, network theory and complexity and emergence. We'll have to actually grow to the field of, uh, you know, uh, of understanding social dynamics m alongside individual decisions. That's probably the move we have to make. But in every respect, by the way, what you've done is absolutely magnificent here. It's an honor for me to open this session. And um, all I can say is uh, uh, I'm willing to come next year. Um, I don't know what we're going to do in nudge stock to top what we, what you've done other than starting a 24 hour rolling um, behavioral science TV station, the kind of CNN of behavioral science. But can I just commend what you're doing? And um, uh, the, the other thing is that um, Zoom don't underestimate the importance of giving the world a crash course in remote working and and particularly uh, video calling. The, the, the enduring importance of this is enormous in, in education, it's important in business, it's important in everything. But the fantastic thing about this is the too much of the world before this was too much about agglomeration. So even within India, everything was agglomerating in a few massive cities, for example. You know, the previous world was all about the over concentration of wealth generation in smaller and smaller spaces and the fact that zoom and this has to an extent broken that kind of you know ultimately of course it ended up enriching landlords more than that it ended up enriching businesses but the fact that um, uh, um this technological revolution has arguably broken the stranglehold of location over things like the provision of education the provision of conferences um uh, you know, the provision of, of, of university lectures, the provision of, of all those events and just ordinary conduct of business where, you know, everybody felt it involved a trip to London and a handshake before you could engage in any exchange. The fact that that's gone has huge economic importance and we, we should never throw that away. I think, by the way, one extra sentence. I think behavioral science has an interesting um, commentary to add uh, on the readiness of people to work remotely and it's this i'm gonna i'm gonna say this just as the end because actually standard economics assumed that people valued leisure and you paid them to work in compensation for lost leisure that was the standard structure of labor economics what i think this has revealed is that people don't necessarily want leisure what they really value is autonomy which is the freedom to work some of the time at a time of your choosing and at a place of your choosing that suits the task that you have to do is actually more valuable to employees. It's vastly less costly to employers than providing leisure or money. And it provides the basis of a completely new and more nuanced labor ex uh, value exchange between employer and workforce. Nobody was investigating the possibility that what people actually wanted was a degree of autonomy over time and place rather than more money, less work. And this counts, I think, as a major discovery. Uh, Rory, that was absolutely fantastic. I think the most, I think the most uh, beautiful thing that you've said is talking about complexity sciences and talking about how um, one human and, and the way that humans behave, that might be attributed to biology, but... Yeah. You look at the whole individual versus the way groups behave. Um, in a way, culture 
becomes biology. It's it's uh, the context. It's a collective group of people who behave in entirely different ways, and um, it's it's it, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, the way that the way that you predict it, the way that you say that tomorrow we will have to talk about collective groups. We may have to look at it from a from a network theory perspective because um, it's interesting the uh, the the paradox that you talk about. Um, you you hear such similar things when it comes to social norms in the in the realm of social norms, how um, you have empirical expectations, you have you have normative yes. expectations, and um, it's impossible to understand that individual without the context of um, the group that he is a part of. Yes, no, I think I think that's absolutely right, and the extent to which our behaviour is hugely affected by the behaviour of others. So, for example, to give a practical case, um, <coughs> when the government in the UK did an opt-out pension. OK, they even they and the behavioral scientists were surprised at the level of, uh, of adoption. So they were expecting about 30 people to opt out to say, I'd rather have the money. I don't want the money to go into a pension. In the end, the opt out rate was about 10 percent. It actually caused a bit of a financial crisis because no one was expecting this. And if you think about it, it's probably two forces working at once, which is we we feel comfortable when we're part of a herd. And there are logical reasons for that, which is when you're part of a herd, you don't need to spend so much time looking out for lions. So if I have a pension and I know that everybody I know at work has the same pension, if anything starts going wrong with that pension, to be honest, I'll never notice. My financial management skills are appalling. But someone in the finance department will notice and we'll all get to find out. It's rather, you know, if you're a grazing antelope, you don't always need to look out for lions. You just keep an eye on the most neurotic antelope. And if, if, if that starts getting jumpy, it's time to run, right? <laughs> okay. And in the same way, I think we need to look at this because some financial products, they're all sold individually. And as a result, we feel terribly nervous. Now, actually, using the employer as the conduit for pre-selected financial products so that everybody has a financial product and they know other people who have the same product is probably a really important insight in the sale of financial services. That part of the problem with financial services is they sold to the lonely, they sold to the individual. And I, I don't give a moment's thought to my company pension because I know there are a lot of people in Ogilvy who are much greedier than I am, who are keeping an eye on the whole thing for me because they effectively have the same pension I do. And so those, you know, it's a feeling when you rationalize, nobody talks about other people. They go, I want the best pension. It's an optimization problem. I want the best pension for me. But actually, if you look at human emotions and feelings, they don't want that. They want a pretty good, satisfying pension that's also held by lots of other people like they know so they feel confident that the what you might call the information asymmetry between pension provider and um and, and pension holder is massively reduced so in that i think people people probably have a massive instinctive understanding an evolved understanding of the market for lemons to use that akalov paper but that, that has a huge bearing i think financial products sold through an employer uh, and it's also worth remembering that the employer, um, in a sense, has access to the personal salary. So a lot of that credit checking at the small level is necessary. And we're starting to see that uh, in the level of small, le small level lending, where employers, in instead of people being forced to go to payday lenders or to, you know, loan sharks at the worst, the employer will lend them money very, very safely because, of course, uh, if he needs his money back, he can simply withhold it from salary. He has a bigger hold, in a sense, uh, than the financial provider does. So uh, so I think whole areas of new product development should emerge from behavioral science, not, you know, as with the Save More Tomorrow pension. We shouldn't focus all our time on communication. We should also be looking at the very design of products themselves. Thank you, uh, Rory, for well, being here. Uh, through all the minor hiccups, uh, as we began, uh, I think it's all turning out smooth. And I guess Zoom is going to save the world. You have been saying about it for quite some time. Yeah, before before the pandemic, in fact, I said to the marketing director of Zoom, which I, makes me wince, about a year ago, what do you really need to get this to take off? 
uh, is either a mass transport strike or a minor pandemic. And I wince every time I remember saying that. <laughs> but I promise we didn't plan this, OK? This is not some part of a, uh, <laughs> a grander scheme. <laughs> but it is interesting because what it suggests, actually, is that what might be good for the economy is occasional short shocks, short shocks that actually maintaining the economy in a state of blissful um, uh, stability may actually, in the medium to long term, be unhealthy because it never forces people to reinvent themselves. And it also shows an interesting thing how businesses think when they're introducing, let's say they're introducing an online um, channel. So a retailer who's introducing a grocery retailer who's offering the ability to sell online. When the grocery retailers were doing that, they thought they were motivated by greed. They thought the principal reason to do this was to sell more groceries to more people more often. What they were really doing was building resilience into their business. Because a business that isn't over optimized around one particular channel of activity is much readier to adapt to sudden changes than a business that only does one thing. I remember you sharing this uh, story about your dictaphone uh, mm. the last time we chatted. I also remember this one story from last year that you were sharing, where I think you had you were supposed to fly down to Singapore or Hong Kong. Or yeah, Singapore Hong Kong. to speak yeah. for 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and, I can't do that. Yeah. And, uh, and you had to uh, say no to the entire invitation uh, because it was just not worth it. I'm, I'm sorry, let me refer. It's just not making sense to fly down all the way across time zones. Uh, in retrospect, now it just seems. It, it just seems insane, doesn't it? That, that we were doing those things. That we and I think physical pleasure was or physical presence. Like physical pleasure. Physical pleasure is fairly fairly important. Um, I think physical presence was almost like a ritual. It was just an assumption, just in the same way that you know, in in nineteenth century England, everybody in the middle class dressed for dinner. You know, and then nobody, as far as I know, in sort of nineteen in nineteenth century England said. You know, is he really necessary to get changed when we eat food? You know, is this really a good use of our time? It was just something that everybody had to do. And I've talked to people in the city of London who say we are now doing multi-million dollar deals between people who've never met. And it was just an assumption that you can't do any lunch. Now, uh, I don't think you need me to tell you this, but the opportunities for the developing countries, in particular India, uh, in professional services, uh, that are presented by the Zoom revolution are spectacular, okay? Um, because geographical location and, in other words, in order to produce, what was the problem? Uh, one of the weird things I told my colleagues, which is a weird advice, I said, now we have Zoom, okay? And now everybody knows how to use and do business and transact over, over video conferencing. I want you to become a bit more random. I want you to speak on more random podcasts, and webinars i want you to if someone rings up with a weird business idea talk to them and they said why, why do you want us to become more random i said look because previously the cost of entry of a hundred thousand dollars worth of business was eight thousand dollars worth of expense or four thousand dollars worth of expense okay in other words in order to, to create a hundred thousand dollars of revenue you had to spend a certain amount on flying on you know on travel on visiting people on hosting a meeting in your offices on getting everybody to fly in from zurich to talk to you okay now is it worth spending five thousand dollars for a five percent chance of a hundred thousand dollars not really okay is it worth two hours on Zoom for a 5% chance of $100,000 every time? Okay, so actually the payment to what you might call random conversation, the rewards to random connection and conversation are now much higher because the barriers to entry are much lower. And those were, I mean, I read a piece which, which, which is fascinating where there's a body of people who think that plowing is unnecessary. There's actually a group called the No-Till Agriculture Group. And some of those people, I think, that ploughing just got established because it worked in very specific situations. And then it became a religious ritual, which is, if I don't plough and my crop fails, I'll feel like an idiot. 
So people were plowing in situations where you could have just used seed drills and you didn't need to destroy all the earthworms and everything else as part of the process. Now, I'm, I'm two generations removed from farmers and I'm not going to give agricultural advice and I don't want anybody to act on that without researching it further. But as I said, dressing for dinner was one of those things which everybody did. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and, and it was just one of those things you had to do. And I think a large part of business travel was the, the 21st century equivalent of dressing for dinner. You know, it, 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 you know, if we look at history, there are plenty of cases in history where everybody, um, everybody engages in an absurd collective behavior because everybody else does. And we see that in history, and we tend to have that sort of slightly smug belief that, of course, in the 20th century, we've got science, and we don't do that anymore because we're scientific. Actually, we do it as much as ever, I think. Thank you, Rory. Uh, you were wonderful. You were very generous with your time. Mm. And um, it's, fantastic to have, it's fantastic to have someone like you um, evangelize on field of, on behalf of the <coughs> all around the world. And uh, as we come to an end, I know there was a small hiccup when we started with the audio. But the good thing uh, about being born in India is we are very comfortable mm. with circular logic. Uh, the one thing about do you, do you have do you have by the way that still that still thing because I've read about it in in British writers on India, which is something which is halfway between a nod and a shake of the head, which is a diagonal head gesture which conveys kind of ambiguity. Does that still exist? There are there are fantastic uh, stereotypes and there are fantastic way we do communicate. Now we do have it. We have it in two thousand different forms. One of the good things about being from India is we know that the word for yesterday, the past, or the word for future, tomorrow is both the same cult. So all the way we start the beginnings, here we go. Oh. To all the people who have joined in from all over the world, good morning. Beat that. That's fantastic. Good afternoon <laughs> and good evening. This is Perfect. our first, the first of many more to come. And we had a very simple introduction ready for Rory. And believe it or not, the introduction was our next guest needs no introduction. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was And you put the introduction at the end, which is perfect. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rory.